Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to part two of two. Uh, today, uh, Jason Chauman will be talking with us about QLCS interrogation and warning strategies. Uh, this is a follow-on to uh, part one that we all participated in uh, yesterday. So, uh, Jason, it's all yours. Oh, good morning uh, once again, everyone. I'm, I'm Jason Shaman. I'm forecaster here at the National Weather Service in Springfield. And as John mentioned, this is going to be presentation number two in a, a two-part uh, series on QLCS interrogation. Uh, first, first presentation yesterday was more on the three ingredients method for anticipating mesovortex genesis and rapid intensification. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is building upon the three ingredients method and, and getting into uh, some radar interrogation strategies, and then also going to be looking at some guidance for issuing severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings. One of the other uh, topics we will be hitting today once we get by the guidance for severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings is polygon strategies for mesovortices. This has been a very hot topic. Um, seems like over the last few years here, um, mesovortices are a much different animal than supercell mesocyclones and issuing tornado warnings for supercells. And we will cover why that is in this presentation. There's, there's, there's many more things to consider when issuing severe tornado warnings uh, for mesovortices. As we kind of talked about yesterday, uh, we're really focused in here when it comes to radar interrogation for QLCSs and mesovortices. We're, we're focused on the process, the what, the when, the where, the how. Um, the stats are going to shake out at the end here. If you focus strictly on stats, uh, you're probably not going to do too well. It's the process that matters. And what we're really trying to accomplish here honing in on the areas that matter. Where are mesovortices and tornadoes favored from a scientific and statistical standpoint within a QLCS? Once you're honing in and concentrating on those areas, you are able to eliminate uh, large portions of QLCSs that aren't going to be conducive for mesovortices. So again, the stats are going to shake out. It's, it's, it's the methodology and the strategy that's important here when, when it comes to tackling QLCSs on radar. Uh, just a quick review for those of you that weren't on the call for yesterday, uh, the three ingredients method. Uh, when it comes to the three ingredients, and again, we're looking at for each of these ingredients to be co-located with each other. Uh, if you've got all three ingredients co-located, that's when you've got a, a strong chance, roughly about 80% or so, of mesovortex genesis and rapid intensification. So. Uh, this is going to be a case, as you can see, from November uh, 2013 across central Indiana. Uh, you can see we've got a, a QLCS there. First thing we've got to do is figure out where that updraft, downdraft convergence zone is. And you do that by looking at your velocity or SRM plot, which you can see on the left here. So kind of trace that down here uh, from east of Remington, uh, west of Monticello, pretty close to Chalmers there and coming down towards Lafayette and towards just the east of Linden there. Then it kind of starts curling back towards Kingman. Well, what I've done there is kind of drawn that out now on the reflectivity plot on the right panel. And you can see it's kind of messy there. It's kind of messy, especially when you look at those uh, updrafts, those cores there. It kind of goes all over the place. But again, what we're looking at when it comes to this updraft, downdraft convergence zone, where does it relate to the reflectivity plot? You know, once you start getting out ahead of a little bit, you're going to be slightly outflow dominant. Once it curls back to where it's right on the leading edge of your stronger cores, that's going to be your balance region. But once you get back into that precipitation region a little bit, that's where you're going to be slightly shear dominant. So going through the three ingredients method, once again with this line segment, where are the 0 to 3 kilometer bulk shear magnitudes greater than or equal to 30 knots? You've got the... Uh, Zero to three kilometer bulk shear overlaid in these black vectors. So where's the line normal component greater than or equal to 30 knots? It's going to be this whole general area of the of the QLCS where you've got that good line normal component. Now, where is the line balanced or slightly shear dominant? It's going to be a large part of this particular line. Uh, you can see there's a trailing supercell down there north north of Clinton, but um, all, 
almost this entire line, with the exception of the far southwest flank there, is going to have going to be balanced or slightly shear dominant. So where are my where are my surges? Where are my bows within this line? Well, you've got several of them there. Um, three of them to be uh, in particular. There, one around Chalmers, uh, one of them there, the battleground Lafayette area, and then finally one down towards Lyndon Crawfordville. So. You've got several areas along this line where your three ingredients are being met for mesovortex genesis and rapid intensification. When it comes to interrogating radar data based on the three ingredients, uh, from a time budget standpoint, every 30 minutes or so, you're going to assess the zero to three kilometer, uh, kilometer line normal bulk shear. Every 30 minutes, when you're getting new model data and maybe a new wrap run just came in uh, or the SPC page updated, you're going to be doing that every 30 minutes to an hour or so. And then the, the question you're really going to be asking yourself with that is, where along my QLCS am I going to have a line normal component greater than or equal to 30 knots? What orientation is it going to take to that updraft, downdraft convergence zone to give me that line normal component greater than or equal to 30 knots? Know that in advance. Uh, if you get a surge or that line pivots for some reason, know in advance what orientation it's going to take to give you that good line normal component. So that's, again, every 30 minutes to an hour for that. Shear cold pool balance regimes, every two to three volume scans or so, so every 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, these things don't change from volume scan to volume scan. They evolve with time. You're not going to go from a cold pool dominant to a balance just like that. These evolve over time as cold pools mature, uh, as updraft strengthens. So every two to three volume scans, keep track of your shear cold pool balance regimes and be seeking out those areas that are balanced or slightly shear dominant. Every volume scan, you are going to be interrogating for surges and bows. Uh, this is going to take up most of your time, as we'll see here over the next couple of slides. Surges and bows, you need to be looking for every volume scan, looking at your velocity products, and, and, and um, also with your reflectivity products. But again, your velocity products are really going to show these surges and bows well, especially the localized ones. You're going to be doing that every volume scan, and of course, you want to be looking for rear inflow notches. You also want to be looking for uh, mid-altitude radial convergence signatures as a precursor to a bow. Additionally, every volume scan, you're going to want to be looking for mesovortices and TDSs. Um, if you've got mesovortices present, track where they're going. Again, they're going to stay in your updraft, downdraft convergence zone, but some of them will tend to migrate north, especially if you've got a slightly sheer dominant portion of the line. Uh, TDSs, uh, there's a couple of slides built into this presentation on this one. Cannot emphasize enough. Be looking for TDSs at all times. Um, and as we'll talk about a bit later, there's a couple of different ways to do that. So getting into the nitty gritty here, we've already covered a part of this, but we're going to go back through each one of the ingredients here and, and the strategies for monitoring. When it comes to the, the line normal bulk shear magnitudes, again, Every 30 minutes or so is when you're going to want to be doing this, when your, your RAP40 or SPC data updates. But monitor those vectors out ahead of the line. Again, we want the ambient vectors out ahead of the line. They, we don't want them contaminated. You've got to represent the ambient atmosphere. What orientations of the updraft, downdraft, convergence zone are going to give you that line normal component uh, greater than or equal to 30 knots? Now, you typically want to do this in your higher radar tilts or you can delegate it to your mesoanalyst. Um, if, if, if your office has a mesoanalyst role that sets up, have them keep an eye on these vectors, and they can brief the radar operator as to what orientations of that line it's going to take to give you that line normal component greater than or equal to 30 knots. Now, when it comes to the shear cold pool balance regimes, again, you're going to do this every two to three volume scans. Uh, you're looking for your balanced or slightly shear dominant regions but again, these are going to evolve with time. They're not going to change on you from volume scan to volume scan. So just keep tabs on those balanced and slightly shear dominant regions. Uh, you're typically going to do this during your high radar tilt. 
Uh, getting into your line surges and bows. Uh, you're going to do this one every volume scan. Uh, use those velocity products. Also, this is kind of going back to the days of Bob Johns, and this is something Ron Presbolinski really preached with me and other radar operators is uh, use the animations. Things really jump out at you when you animate uh, the velocity and the reflectivity products. Perhaps you're getting uh, something that's starting to surge or bow out. Very revealing. But again, as we mentioned earlier, looking for the RINs and the mark signatures as a precursor to a localized surge or a bow. And given that you're looking for a potential uh, low-level low signatures and then your mid-upper level signatures with the marks, you're going to use an all-tilt um, all tilt when it comes to your radar products uh, for interrogating for the surges and bows. And as you can see at the bottom of this slide, if you've met those other two ingredients and now you, you're starting to detect a surge or a bow, you're going to want to ready some sort of a polygon, uh, whether it be a severe thunderstorm or tornado warning. We'll talk about that here a little bit later in the presentation. but. This is when you want to be readying a polygon upon surge detection if the other two ingredients are met. Uh, finally, mesovortices, TDSs. Again, you're going to be monitoring for these every volume scan in conjunction with your surges. Uh, study those mesovortex migrations. Are they staying anchored in the balance region just to the north of a bow or a surge apex? Or are they tending to migrate north along your updraft, downdraft convergence zone? Uh, always be looking for the TDSs. Um, I will say these things are occurring way more frequently than you think. Uh, this has become very evident to us uh, with dual pole technology. Um, there's a lot of research out there that shows that supercells produce the vast majority of tornadoes, in my opinion, over the next three to five years or so, um, these stats are going to change a little bit. There's a lot more of these QLCS tornadoes that appear to be occurring than what we previously thought. We've got a lot of these, uh, these TDS uh, CC drop type signatures showing up along these QLCSs that you know, maybe in the past we wouldn't have known about them. So I, I just cannot emphasize enough, be watching for TDSs at all times. So what, what are we really after here in terms of this interrogation strategies and the summary? The 0 to 3 kilometer vectors, although that's the newest part when it comes to research of the 3 ingredients method, they almost become an afterthought. If you've got good tabs on what orientations it's going to take to a QLCS to give you that good line normal component, it, it's, it's an afterthought. You don't have to worry about it anymore if you're a radar operator. Just keep tabs on them every half hour, hour and move on. The sheer cold pool balance regimes, again, they evolve with time, so you're not having to spend a ton of time as a radar operator worrying about those. Just keep tabs on your, your balance and slightly sheer dominant regions and, and track the inflection points. Again, an inflection point is going to be your area where you go from balance to slightly sheer dominant. Most of your time is going to be spent interrogating for developing surges and bows and tracking those mesovortices. As we briefly talked about in yesterday's presentation, what we're really trying to do here when it comes to actual warning strategies is putting the odds in the favor of the radar operator using a scientific weather ball approach. Again, for those of you that saw the movie Moneyball, it's a, it's a baseball movie, putting the stats in your favor to win games. You know, John Gagan here in our office came up with this term, and that's really what we're trying to do with these QLCS, uh, severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings making sound radar decision based on the stats and based on the science, playing the percentages. As we move into the warning guidance section of this presentation, that's what we're really trying to accomplish here. Uh, one real quick point, obviously QLCS's squall lines can produce straight line winds from other mechanisms besides mesovortices. We're going to be strictly uh, focusing on mesovortices, but as we all know, uh, there are many other mechanisms that could put down damaging straight line winds within a squall line. Okay, moving into the severe thunderstorm warning scenarios. Again, do want to emphasize this is just guidance. There's a lot of other factors that can come into play, but this is what we've found in our office and, and, and using a lot of the research that's out there. Uh, this seems to work very well. 
consider a severe thunderstorm warning when the three ingredients are met. That simple. Remember, going back to the, the howling study that McKenna did, the majority of times when the three ingredients were met, vast majority, I should say, 80% of the time we had mesovortices that developed. Additionally, more than half of the mesovortices produced some sort of severe phenomena, whether it be straight line winds or tornadoes. So the stats are in our favor there. Uh, when it comes to the howling study, uh, additionally, there's a lot of other previous studies that are out there that, again, show that the majority of mesovortices produce some sort of severe weather. The second scenario for considering a severe thunderstorm warning, some of your mesovortex rotational velocity and forward speed of the mesovortex exceed 50 knots. Basically, what we're looking for there is kind of the additive effects at the southern flank of your mesovortex. You've got a decent circulation and you've also got a good forward motion to that, uh, mesovortices have a propensity to mix down higher, mo uh, higher momentums to the surface. That's really what we're keying in on there. Now, I will say you may want to lower that threshold just a little bit if you're in the presence of heavier precipitation. Uh, you get some kind of a, a, a precipitation loading effect going on, and you, may, you get, may get some enhanced momentum transfer down towards the surface. Are there any questions up to this point when it comes to uh, what we've covered all the way through the severe thunderstorm warning guidance? Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. This is going to be the tornado possible tag within a severe thunderstorm warning uh, for the IBW participating offices. As you will see in this slide, obviously we we're not confident quite yet enough to issue a tornado warning, but confidence is high enough for a severe, and one of the following occurs. Well, three ingredients are met, or mesovortices are present. Well, you may be saying to yourself, well, Jason, it's pretty much the same guidance as a severe thunderstorm warning. Well, yes, it is. But remember, going back to one of the early slides yesterday, uh, mesovortices are a bottom-up type process. These things tend to develop on average about a kilometer or so above the ground. Some as low as a half kilometer, some a little bit higher into that one and a half to two kilometers range. But uh, given that these are a bottom-up process and, and very close to the ground, with most mesovortices, a, a tornado is technically possible. Now, if, if you want to kind of use a ramp-up effect, uh, you could hold off on maybe using the tornado possible tag until you actually see a mesovortex. That's fine, but again, keep in mind that once you get beyond 40 nautical miles from the radar, you're not going to see the genesis region of most mesovortices. You can see mature mesovortices beyond 40 nautical miles because they tend to grow upward with time. So we kind of used this slide as a teaser towards the end of yesterday's presentation. What if we were to issue a tornado warning every time the three ingredients met, were met, and then we compared that to uh, GIPRA goals? Um, three ingredients being met, issuing a tornado warning based on the Howling study, had a very high POD, right around 86%. False alarm was a little bit high, but again, very close to the GIPRA goal, right around 74% with the lead time of about 18 minutes, which does offer about a five-minute advantage, advantage uh, based on GIPRA goals. But again, we're using this as just a baseline. Uh, again, radar operators in the past have tended to wait for mesovortex genesis to issue severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings. And, and going back to some of the studies, uh, TRAP et al. 99, even 2005, it's just not going to give you that much lead time. So we're looking for more there to get advanced lead time for severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings uh, with, these, with these QLCS mesovortex situations. So how do we build on this baseline? Well, we're looking for additional radar signatures in, in addition to the three ingredients method and mesoscale parameters which indicate an increased likelihood for tornadoes. I will say, using this approach locally, 
has, res has resulted in a pretty significant drop in, in false alarm rate in our office while ma maintaining a high probability of detection. In terms of pure numbers, I, I will say most of these statistics are still pre preliminary for our office. Uh, the, the three ingredients method we've been applying here for about, about three years or so, uh, really since 2012, going back to the paper that, that Ron and I did, we, we really didn't get into some of the radar signatures that I'm about to show here until the last year or so. so the, uh, the jury's still out on the actual radar signatures, but just applying the three ingredients method alone, our, our false alarm rate for tornadoes in our office dropped from about 79% down to 58%. Uh, so from 2012 to 2014, we were down to 58% or so on the false alarm rate. Uh, 2009 to 2011, we were up around 79%. We had about the same amount of tornadoes during both time periods, uh, 31 for the 2009 to 2011 period, and 36 to, from the 2012 to 2014 period. I will say, admittedly, our PODs for those two time periods were about the same, but a little bit on the low side. 2009 to 2011, we were around 58%. Jumped up slightly to 61% in 2012 to 2014. We'd like to get those higher. Um, and that's where we really started bringing in some of these uh, radar signatures that we're about to show. Uh, we feel strongly that those are going to increase our POD. Uh, one of the little caveat I'll throw out there is the why our POD may have been a bit low uh, over these last five to six years or so is our radar operators just weren't that comfortable issuing tornado warnings when they couldn't see the whites of its eyes of mesovortices. Again, you get beyond 40 nanagala miles, you're not going to see these mesovortices often. So very hard to pull the trigger on a tornado warning when you're not seeing a circulation on radar. So kind of a confidence factor there, too. When it comes to our general guidelines for issuing uh, a tornado warning, uh, we've basically broken it down to eight possible scenarios to consider these tornado warnings, with also four possible positive nudgers uh, when it comes to considering a tornado warning. And again, these are based on multiple factors, the three ingredients method being a baseline, but then we've got some other radar signatures built in, and also some other mesoscale uh, environmental parameters built in. Let's go ahead and move into the eight scenarios for considering a tornado warning. Scenario number one, three ingredients are met with a well-pronounced surge or bow echo. Now, as we talked about yesterday, surges and bow echoes can greatly vary in size. When it comes to the smallest of surges, a localized surge, we're looking for that to displace itself at least five nautical miles from the remainder of the localized line segment. And we've got an example of that here coming up. If you're looking at a, a larger surge or a bow echo, is that thing accelerating or following through? Local surge example first. Uh, you can see on this slide, I've got a couple of examples. We talked a little bit about the, the Willard, Missouri tornado event from 2012. That's going to be that left slide there. Uh, you'll see there's a uh, Actually, three different surges present on this slide. Uh, there's one just to the south of Everton, Missouri. Got another little one south of that one. And you'll notice this bigger one to the northwest of uh, Republic, Missouri here. You'll notice how that one's come out a lot more than those other two. Uh, if you do some math here, the original updraft, downdraft convergence zone was in the far southwest of this county, part of this county, which is Greene County. It's really juttered out there nicely, right towards our radar RDA here. That, that displaced itself about five nautical miles at that point. This did go on. You can actually start to see a mesovortex developing here. This mesovortex would go on to strengthen and produce a tornado in the south side of Willard here. Uh, a couple volume scans later. Uh, the central Indiana event, we've actually got two pretty decent surges here. This one up north is more of a localized surge in nature. Uh, this one down south here is a, a little bit larger in nature, uh, broader, but nevertheless, both of these went on to spawn mesovortices. Uh, you can actually see a, a nice one here to the south of Lafayette. Uh, looking further north, there's actually a mesovortex also present here uh, between uh, Remington's, I believe that's Chalmers, kind of covered up with the arrow there. 
But again, can't emphasize enough, use the SRM or Velocity products when it comes to looking at these. If you remember the earlier slide with the Central Indiana event, that reflectivity is really messy. Uh, but the, these surges and bows show up much nicer when you're looking at the Velocity or SRM products. Here is an example of an accelerating bow echo. Uh, this one came out of northeast Oklahoma back in September of 2014. Uh, you can see as it's approaching Neosho, Missouri there how much, how, how much it's bowed out. I believe, going off memory, this produced two or three different tornadoes uh, pretty close to the Neosho area in Newton County here. Scenario number two for considering a tornado warning. Three ingredients are met in the vicinity of an inflection point. And again, the inflection point is going to be the area where your updraft, downdraft convergence go zone goes from immediately ahead of your deep reflectivity cores and curls back into uh, your reflectivity into your slightly shear dominant region. That area is trouble. Uh, if you're seeing an inflection point within a QLCS, oftentimes you're going to get a strong mesovortex genesis with an increased likelihood for tornadoes. Uh, you will see pictured here a conceptual model of something we call a New Jersey echo. Uh, it's just one version of a radar echo that includes an inflection point. As you can see in this particular one here, it's also got a front inflow and rear inflow notch. New Jersey echoes, if you're seeing one of these, definitely got an increased likelihood for a tornado. Uh, one thing I emphasized in the, the previous presentation, but I, again, want to emphasize this again, if you're getting slightly shear dominant portions of a QLCS, uh, that likely means your shear is a bit stronger with the event. You're, you're going to need at least 35 knots of line normal, 0 to 3 kilometer bulk shear. Once you start getting to that 35 to 40 knot line normal range, that seems to kind of be a sweet spot for a uh, for, uh, the rapid mesovortex tornado, uh, genesis and tornado, um, increase in tornado uh, likelihood. So again, 35 to 40 knots, be wary. That that's really seems to be a sweet spot. Go back to that Willard event. Again, you've got an inflection point here present uh, to the southwest of Willard where you're going for your balance into your slightly shear dominant region. You see that updraft, downdraft convergence zone curls in there nicely. This is going to be your trouble area for mesovortex genesis. And in this particular event, that is indeed where that developed. Scenario number three for considering a tornado warning. We've kind of already covered this one. Uh, three ingredients are met with a paired front inflow and rear inflow notch. We're all pretty familiar with this one. There's, there's been a lot of studies out there, including studies by Ron, uh, that indicate when you've got that paired, uh, paired notch uh, signature, uh, you're, you're, you've got basically an implied uh, increased source of, of, of vertical vorticity uh, within that localized area of a QLCS. They come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, the New Jersey Echo is just one of them. Seen what echoes that look like seahorses or just uh, straight S-shaped echoes. Now, sometimes the front inflow notches on these QLCSs can be tough to detect if you've got leading stratiform precipitation. Going into some examples of paired inf uh, front inflow, rear inflow notches, we already saw one. Uh, you can see on the, uh, the image on the left there, this is kind of a broader, bigger front inflow, rear inflow notch coupled, coupled there. Uh, uh, you can see the front inflow notch near Greenfield, Missouri with an, uh, a very good-looking uh, rear inflow notch coming in from the Sheldon, Missouri. This, that, that bow echo there had a really nice uh, mesoscale rear inflow jet with it. So just a classic look to it. And then uh, the, the right image there was across eastern Mississippi. Uh, this is one of those cases where the, the front inflow notch isn't nearly as apparent as perhaps the, the left slide there. But nevertheless, you can certainly, uh, you can certainly see the paired, paired signature there. And, I do want to give thanks to uh, a colleague of mine, Doug Kramer, here. He, is, he has really built up a nice catalog of these paired front inflow and rear inflow notches. And another particular uh, radar signature we're about to look at here. But I uh, really want to thank Doug for putting a, together a nice catalog of these. It's been very helpful when it, when, when it comes to the, coming up with these eight scenarios for considering a tornado warning. A scenario 
in area number four for considering a tornado warning. This is a Ron Presbolinski special right here. Uh, the three ingredients are met with a, a surge or a bow ingesting a stationary or quasi-stationary vorticity source. Uh, th these boundaries can, can be produced by a couple of different mechanisms. Uh, synoptic scale boundaries. You've got a, some sort of a stalled out frontal boundary uh, with some sort of a bow echo uh, moving up that, that frontal boundary. That, that can be trouble right there. Uh, perhaps a little more common could be a convective outflow, a leftover outflow boundary from previous convection. That could be another source of vorticity. But as we're about to see in this next slide here, perhaps one of the most common vorticity sources uh, that a bow or a surge can interact with is going to be an actual ongoing outflow boundary from a copal dominant convective situation. Uh, as you can see uh, from this event, which is was kind of across uh, central Missouri there, um, you've got a line that's kind of folded over here, you know, good north-south orientation to this portion of the line. And, you can see we've got a zero to three kilometer bulk shear vectors overlaid, kind of pointing to the northeast. So good line normal component here around Cook Station, Missouri. But you notice this line really folded over here on Steelville. Very poor line normal component to the zero to three kilometer bulk shear vectors here, which resulted in that portion of the line being outflow dominant. Well, this outflow dominant portion of the line sent an outflow boundary to interact with this bow. And indeed, had a, I believe it was two different tornadoes. One for sure that it was a producer on Cherryville, but I believe it went on to produce a second tornado in the vicinity of Cherryville with this. One thing I really want to point out when it comes to these boundaries, though, you don't want them to be on the move to the south. You want them to be stationary or quasi-stationary so where that bow or surge has time to ingest that vertical vorticity, tilt it, stretch it. Uh, to, to produce, uh, get, get your mesovortex genesis going there. So you don't want it hauling south. You want it to be quasi-stationary or stationary. This one is a little bit newer. Um, you all may not be as familiar with this one. And th this is something Doug has really uh, latched onto into this office. There's been a couple of other offices I've heard talk about these. I, I, I know Ron did, and I, I believe the Jackson, Mississippi office, I don't know if uh, anybody from there is on chat or not, uh, but the front uh, this this what we call a front end nub. Uh, these were not readily apparent before we got super res reflectivity. Once we started, once we got the super res technology going here, these started showing up more and more. And what we're kind of talking about when it comes to these 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 front end nubs is just kind of this 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 kink in the line with almost a squared off reflectivity signature. You know, we have theorized, you know, what in the world is going on here? Our, our latest theory is this is just a, a perhaps a localized version of a localized surge with a paired front inflow and rear inflow notch. Uh, as you can see in this particular one, uh, you, you can imply our front inflow notch here. Uh, and this is actually near the location of an ongoing tornado with the signature. And then perhaps a rear inflow notch uh, down to the south here a little bit. Uh, this, this occurred in 2011 in southern Tennessee. You'll notice in this particular, um, this particular radar image, you do have some sort of a couplet here going on just to the north of this surge apex. May not be that great. We have noticed sometimes with these, these front end nubs that oftentimes you will not even see a, a couplet when it comes to the velocity products. This is especially true if your radar happens to be shooting through the reflectivity core. Uh, sometimes you'll get some sort of a downstream, you know, weak hail spike or something like that. So sometimes these, these uh, velocity couplets aren't even showing up with these, these front end nubs, but more time than not, when we're seeing these nubs like this, we're, we're getting some kind of a, either a strong mesovortex or a tornado. Uh, scenario number six for considering a tornado warning. A contracting bookend vortex, which displays increasing rotational velocities. You know, as we all know, when it comes to these, these bookend vortices, uh, 
especially these cyclonic rotating ones. They're going to occur along the northern portion of your QLCS. Uh, what we're really focusing in on with these uh, attracting bookends is increasing gate-to-gate -gate signatures within the broader circulation. Uh, good starting point for considering a tornado warning with these gate-to-gate -gate signatures within the broader, broader circulation is a rotation of velocity right around 25 knots or so or greater. Again, good starting point in, in the next slide, in scenario number seven, or two slides from now in scenario number seven, we will show you why 25 knots uh, seems to be a, a good threshold here. Uh, this is an event we had not too long ago here in the Springfield CWA, back in October of last year. Uh, you can see uh, on the, the reflectivity image, there's really not much going on there. Uh, you could make an argument that this was a true shear dominant portion of the line, not even slightly shear dominant, but true shear dominant to where there's just nothing left of the convective towers from Springfield onto the northwest here. Yet if you look in the, the SRM, the velocity product here, you could certainly see you've got the, these, uh, these increased gate-to-gate -gate signatures there, and we did indeed confirm the tornado uh, with that signature there. And again, 25 knots or so is, is a good starting point there for considering a tornado warning. Now, why 25 knots? Well, this is kind of getting into scenario seven, which is a pretty generic scenario. You've got a mesovortex present, the tight and strong mesovortex. Again, looking for 25 knots or so as a starting point of rotation of velocity. Why 25 knots? Well, this goes to a, a more recent study by Smith et al. back in 2012. If you look at the box and whisker plots there for QLCS tornadoes, uh, even in the, the, the uh, EF0 category there, which we doc they documented 106 of these, you'll notice that the lower end of your, basically 75% of the tornadoes, these EFZ tornadoes occurred with a VR of 24 knots or greater. So. Those are pretty strong supporting numbers when it comes to that 25-knot threshold there. Now, obviously, as you go into the EF0, EF1 range, even better support for the 25 knots. What's a little bit scary here with this, this uh, Smith et al. plot is the amount of overlap there when it comes to these QLCS tornadoes ranging from your EF0s to twos. Quite a bit of overlap there. So when it comes to predicting tornado intensities, based on uh, rotation of velocity alone. A little tougher, a little bit tougher there. Uh, again, when it comes to the actual genesis of these mesovortices, you're not going to see the initiation of them. You're getting beyond 40 nautical miles from radar. You may see the mature ones. You, know, you can see mature mesovortices some, sometimes 70, 80 nautical miles from the radar, but you're just waiting for these circulations to develop. It may be too late. Again, going back to the trap study, these things tend to develop about five minutes or so uh, before actual tornado genesis. So if you're waiting for mesovortex genesis to blast out uh, severe thunderstorm or tornado warnings in this particular case, you're not going to get much lead time, if any, at all. Scenario number eight for considering a tornado warning. Ingredients are, ingredients are met with the TDS. Well, we, we know it's too late then. You've got debris being lofted in the air. We've got a tornado that's either ongoing or it has already occurred and is lifted. We don't know that. Obviously, debris can, uh, debris can be remain lofted in the air for several volume scans after a tornado has occurred. Uh, the incre the, the, um, when it comes to ingredient number eight, what we're basically trying to get at here, now we know this is a tornado setup. You've got a QLCS in a mesoscale environment that is conducive to, for tornadoes, so three ingredients are going to remain. Uh, you may want to consider a tornado warning anyway. We already know that you've got a good setup for tornadoes since one is occurring as it recently occurs. So maybe one of those things where you, you just kind of eat the stats there. You've you got to miss, but you may have more downstream. Again, TDSs, similar to mesovortes, may may not be visible at greater distances from the radar, especially with your weaker EF zeros or perhaps low end EF ones. But even even with the, the zeros or ones, you, you can see those oftentimes greater than 40 nautical miles. Can't emphasize enough 
be looking for these every volume scans. I, I know I'm beating this one to death, but I just it happened to us the other day, to be honest with y'all, to where we were we were looking a whips. Look, we we were looking for TDSs. We actually missed one. We were we were focused in on the half degree tilt, where we should have been looking at the point nine also, because a little bit noisy at the point five. And sure enough, we looked at, we looked at a day or two later, there it was. So I can't emphasize enough: be looking for these TDSs at all times. When it comes to interrogating for TDSs, uh, we're, we're still in AWIPS one office. When it comes to the four panels, the, just the base four panels, when it came with when, when, it, when we got the dual pole upgrade here, they just weren't conducive to monitoring for TDSs when it came to having the right radar products on all on the same screen without without having to toggle back and forth. So what we've done here is made some custom uh, radar procedures to where you've got your, your reflectivity your velocities, your ZDRs, and your CCs all on one screen in an all-tilt fashion. This has been uh, very helpful to us when it comes to interrogating and keeping an eye out for TDSs. Uh, one thing we did also when it came to the actual velocity products in this upper right panel is be able to toggle between SRM and velocity. And, and, and this is really uh, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, sometimes when you've got these really quickly advancing uh, QLCSs, squall lines, sometimes your base velocity is going to be better to look at when it comes to identifying mesovortices uh, or developing uh, surges. Another thing, just plain and simply, you want to know what your base velocities are looking like when it comes to just a straight line wind threat. So I would highly recommend, if you haven't done so already, uh, may maybe creating a, a procedure like this where you've got all those those velocity and dual pole products on one screen, where you can you don't have to toggle back and forth to kind of compare and contrast. Well, do I have enough reflectivity to meet the TDS criteria? Is my CC low enough, et cetera, et cetera? H have them all on the same screen. Uh, one one kind of one final thing here that we kind of stumbled into when we created this procedure. This is a great way to keep track of your shear cold pool balance regime. Since it's all on the screen, same screen and right next to each other, very easy for us to look at where's my updraft, downdraft, convergence zone and compare it to reflectivity with your cursor. You know, your balance, slightly shear dominant regions really jump out that way. There's been a couple of email threads on this one, but this is definitely going to be a good refresher for those of you that already know about this. But those of you that haven't heard about this, um, Strongly recommend having two people looking for TDSs. You, you may have a, a primary radar operator, operator and a secondary. Uh, maybe you, your office likes to go with a primary operator and then a radar assistant, or maybe you have a meso analyst available. Have two people looking for them. You know, if you've got somebody interrogating radar data, blasting out warnings, you know, having to type into their their text window to add some value to a warning, very easy to miss TDSs. Have two people looking for them at all times. Have somebody go back and look at them even after an event. One thing we really want to emphasize is use AOFs and GR2 in tandem if your bandwidth allows. Um, AOFs and GR operate slightly differently when it comes to uh, especially your, your correlation coefficients, your CC. Your AOF CCs kind of smooth things out, filters out the noise, so oftentimes you're not going to see the, the, the smaller CC drops with perhaps some of these weaker tornadoes. That's where GR2 really stands out here to where you're going to see the smaller CCS drops. Another thing when it comes to GR versus AWIPS, the, the dual pole products are not available in sales scans in AWIPS right now, but they are available in GR2. So you get those updates every two minutes or so if you're in a VCP 12.2.12 mode, uh, VCP there, be looking for them in GR2 that way. That's a huge advantage right now of GR2 over AOIPS when it comes to monitoring for TDSs. And then one huge reminder, if you're getting within 30 nautical miles of your RDA, turn off CMD. If you've got CMD turned on and you're looking for TDSs, good luck because it's going to filter a lot of them out, especially the weaker ones. 
Uh, make sure you turn off your CMD once you start getting close to the radar for uh, possible TDS candidates. Okay, so we covered the eight scenarios for considering a tornado warning. Uh, here are four nudgers. Uh, you know, maybe you're on the fence or something like that. Something that can nudge you, lean you towards issuing a tornado warning. Uh, we're going to go into most of these four nudgers here and, uh, and give you an example of them. But when it comes to items number two and number three, um, number two, you've got an updraft, uh, reflectivity course spiking in the vicinity of a surge, or you've got low-level CAPE, ML CAPE of greater than uh, or equal to 40 joules per kilogram, what we're really looking for is enhanced uh, tilting and stretching scenarios. Again, mesovortices are a bottom-up type thing, so what can we do to further enhance uh, the, the stretching of the circulation, really tighten it up? That's what scenarios number two and number three are really doing here. Now, reflectivity tags, there, there's been a little bit of talk about these over the last three to four years. I'll have to apologize. I've seen an email, uh, several email threads on this, and, and, and perhaps even some literatures, but I can't recall the names on these. I know there was a paper about reflectivity tags several years back that mainly focused on these, these reflectivity tags behind the line. But I, I want to say there's been some research done. Great Lakes office, Michigan office. Again, I apologize. I can't remember the names on these now. That have talked about what these things may be, and um, it's, it's our opinion that y you've got some kind of a, a wave-like motion going on here, often correlated to low level, a low-level jet to where you've, you've got these gravity waves going on, kicking off if you're reaching the uh, perhaps the, uh, the LCL or LFC level. You've got these little waves of precipitation moving up the front end uh, of these QLCSs, that may provide some sort of a vorticity source of ingestion for these QLCSs coming in from the west or southwest. Uh, you've got a couple of reflectivity tag examples uh, on these two images. One's the Indiana event and one's that Willard tornado event. I uh, will say we see these a lot with a lot of the, our QLCSs uh, once you get to the nighttime hours and early morning hours, again, perhaps indicative of a uh, decoupling, a little bit of decoupling in a low-level jet, but if you were going to issue tornado warnings every time you saw one of these, these reflectivity tags, you'd have massive FAR. So that's why we've thrown this into the nudger category versus the scenario category. I do want to pause right here for a minute. Do we have any offices on from the Great Lakes that maybe have looked into these to where you could fill us in a little bit more? Uh, Jason, this is Lyle Barker from the uh, Lincoln office. Yes, Lyle. Yeah, I, I did a paper on this back for the SLS back in 2005, I think it was. Okay. And I, I think that was kind of the first time that people started taking notice, because that was right after the Super Res uh, upgrade, and we didn't really have the tools to view them before that. Um, we've used them extensively here, and... Uh, the key is what you just said, though. You've got to, it's really just something to have you focus on a particular portion of the line rather than just issuing a, a warning based on a tag intersection. You've got to really, that just kind of aims your focus, because if you issued it every time you had one of these tags intersecting a, uh, the line, you're going to have way too many false alarms. So it just calls your attention to a particular area. Okay, Lyle. My apologies. That I, 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 you may be that our original paper I was thinking about. Very, very possible. I, I appreciate your input there. Uh, move on from the the reflectivity uh, tag example to to another one of the nudgers, and uh, this is something that uh, that Gene Bruski, uh, myself, and Ron, and a few others. Uh, really collaborated on, and this was an uh, event back in northeastern Wisconsin uh, back in August of 2013. Again, what we're looking for uh, with these, what we're terming a multi-cell core or spike, is something that can enhance that low-level updraft to really get your stretching of, of, of mesovortices going. So 
If you've got any kind of cellular development out ahead of your main convective line, and, and this is often how multi-cells behave, but you've got cells going up, new cores going up out ahead of the line. Uh, when those cells merge in with the main matured line, that can often provide a source of increased low-level stretching. And in this particular case, uh, that does indeed appear, uh, it appears that's what occurred there as this line approached uh, the Fremont area and eventually New London there, you had those cores uh, merging with the line that did help mesovortex genesis. And I believe, Gene, I don't know, I'm not sure if you're on the call or not, but uh, I want to see you had one or two tornadoes occur uh, as, this, as these, these, these cores merged uh, with the main line. Are you on the call, Gene? Yeah, Jason, uh, I am, and that's exactly right. Um, even before this time period, early, earlier on, we, we saw evidence of this multi-cell behavior. Um, and, uh, you know, unlike some of the discussion on the refle reflectivity tags, um, you know, where those little cells will tend to kind of propagate kind of like north or parallel to the, to the line, where these developed right out ahead and just got absorbed uh, immediately into the line, and as soon as that merger occurred, um, mesovortex would, uh, mesovortices would, would evolve, and in this case, a, a volume scan or two later, we got two very rapid spin-ups um, with one EF2 and one EF1 uh, tornado. So, uh, yeah, very revealing, um, and you've got to be in pretty close range to, to see this, but um, once Ron and yourself and others brought this to my attention, I'm starting to see this kind of behavior <clears throat> in many other cases as well. So it's really, really can provide some clues as to uh, anticipating uh, a rapid spin-up in mesovortex genesis. Thanks for that, uh, that input, Gene. I actually got one, one more slide here. A little bit later in this event, not too much later, though, uh, the individual cores on the reflectivity weren't as evident, at least when it came to the, the half-degree tilt there. But as you can see with the VIL product, yet again, you had new cores developing. Oh, gosh, I, I don't have my counties labeled on here. I, th I think this is Outagamie County, but uh, a central part of the county here, you really got some cores rapidly uh, developing. And as this merged in uh, with the main line here, again, I believe you had additional tornadoes develop. Uh, near the Appleton area and uh, eastern portions of that county. Does that sound right there, Gene? Yep, yep, that's correct. Okay, okay. I should mention too, Jason, in this case, you note that, that uh, if you go back to that last slide, you see that uh, area convection going east-west. That that's, uh, was a convective uh, outflow boundary, uh, and that uh, was an important player in this event as well. We had uh, a couple of quick spin-ups uh, just east of Green Bay, uh, that dropped a tornado right on that boundary, uh, just south of the apex. So um, this kind of had a, a couple of interesting up. aspects to it. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up there, Gene. I I completely forgotten about that, but that goes back to one of the actual scenarios for considering a tornado warning. Here you've got that line that is indeed folded over, uh, which which likely sent an outflow boundary down into the surge region. And I believe also, as we discussed with Ron, uh, there was a, even a synoptic scale boundary. So uh, an optic scale boundary, reinforcing outflow. You had a nice boundary that that, that bow uh, ingested for this particular event. So had a lot of things coming together uh, for this particular QLCS. So putting the odds in our favor, again, we're going to the, the weather ball scenario here. Well, one of the eight scenarios we discuss is often worthy of considering a tornado warning. Again, we're not looking for a bunch of the scenarios. One of the eight is often worthy of considering a tornado warning. If you're starting to get multiple scenarios present and or nudgers present, it should further increase your confidence uh, in, in issuing a tornado warning. And, and Gene just set us up beautifully uh, with his input there. We, we had multiple scenarios present uh, with that last slide there, with the outflow in there, the three ingredients were being met. Um, then you had nudgers present also. That, 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 was gonna, that was starting to lead us into a highly confident tornado warning for that particular event. Uh, going back to the, the, the Willard, Missouri tornado event, uh, just kind of countered up the, uh, the scenarios and nudgers for that event. As you can see here, we had six of them present here. We, we, we had a strong surge that developed just to the north of Republic. 
had our inflection point. Uh, we did at time C uh, paired front inflow, rear inflow notch. Uh, later on in the sequence, we had strong mesovortices. We eventually had TDSs, and we had the reflectivity tags moving up the line. So a lot of things there that, that, that gave us high confidence for issuing a tornado warning for that particular event. Uh, the Central Indiana event, just off the charts. Uh, darn near all of them were present, uh, with perhaps the exception of, I, I don't think there was a bound, any kind of a boundary, outflow boundary, folded over uh, boundary there, but we were darn near meeting all of the scenarios and even nudgers. Um, you know, some of them aren't pictured here, but there was, there was definitely low-level cape for this particular event, but not going to read them all off here, but when you've got that many of the scenarios and nudgers present, uh, present that's going to be a, a, a situation where that you'd have pretty high confidence in a tornado warning. And uh, looking at that velocity product in the top image there, you can see that there's a, there are actually uh, several mes mesovortices present just kind of going up the line here, uh, even one up towards the Chalmers area. Uh, when it comes to stats and Gipper goals here, again, we're not focused on stats. We're focused on the process. The, the, you focus on the process, the radar interrogation strategies, and then, then applying the three ingredients, the scenarios, the nudgers, uh, the stats are going to shake out. Now, cold season events, they're going to be the tough ones. Sometimes you're not going to see the scenarios or nudgers, uh, especially in the cold season. Small surges, um, sometimes they show up, sometimes they don't. But even if they do, you know, if they're a localized surge, but they're just not jutting out that far, you probably don't need to be issuing tornado warnings for all those. Because if we do, you know, we're going to have high false alarm. If we're blasting out tours for each one of those little surges, high false alarm, perhaps a confusing message. you got polygons all over the place. We're trying to hit the high percentage areas, going back to the scenarios and nudgers when it comes to issuing the tours versus every little surge. And remember, you know, some events are going to go well, some aren't. You know, it's, it's, this is a marathon, not a sprint, when it comes to the actual statistics here. It's the warm season events where we're likely going to have the best statistics. The reason for that being is we're going to have probably more mesovortex development, just simply due to the fact that you're going to have better thermo uh, better low-level cape, those types of things, to where you're going to get more mesovortices, stronger mesovortices, deeper mesovortices. They're going to be longer lasting. Um, going back to that Indiana event, I uh, didn't, didn't have a slide for this, but if you were to look at a, a tornado track plot for that event, uh, you will note that you would see that they, they had several tornadoes from mesovortices and also a couple from supercells. The longer tracks were from mesovortex tornadoes, not the supercell ones in that particular CWA. Uh, the strongest tornadoes, I believe, were also from mesovortices, not supercells. I, I can't remember. They may have had a, an EF2 for one of the supercells. But, uh, Indianapolis, are you on this call? Uh, maybe not, but... Uh, Go ahead and move yeah, on. I am. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you verify uh, the longer tornado tracks of that event were from the QLCS? Is that correct? I think you had two longer track tornadoes at the QLCS portion of that line. Well, let's see. I couldn't honestly tell you uh, off the top of my head. Okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough. I, I recall seeing on your web page you all had done a nice write-up on that event. And looking at the tracks and comparing to the radar data, it did appear that, uh, well, actually just flip to the next slide here, from that inflection point onto the north here, you had uh, two really, uh, really long tornado tracks. I want to say one of those did push EF3, if I recall correctly. But you did eventually... Yeah, one, Go ahead. One did reach EF3. Uh, we had... Uh, Several EF twos, but uh, one made it to uh, EF three in the Kokomo vicinity for a short part of its track. Okay, okay, yeah, that was somewhere right in here. If you can see my cursor, if I remember correctly, um, and then I think this supercell down here did eventually produce, but it it, it took a while. 
I think it got more into the central part of your CWA. Okay, thanks for that input. Um, uh, as with supercells, uh, looks can be deceiving. You know, looking at this radar reflectivity here, it appears that your strongest core is occurring in this area, but you know, looking up north, this core does appear weaker. But again, as we've already shown in a couple of slides, you do have a surge here. You're meeting the three ingredients, and you've got a mesovortex present. Or present. So you get further away from the RDA here. Don't let the appearance of quote unquote weaker cores fool you. Again, this is a bottom up type thing. So if you've got the three ingredients met, assume that mesovortex is, is going to occur, is already occurring. You just may not be seeing it. So, kind of going on that distance from radar theme, does it matter when it comes to the eight scenarios? For those scenarios with the uh, the longer orange arrows next to it, ra distance from radar really doesn't come into play, uh, especially now that we're into the, the, the super res era. Where we are able to imply those first four scenarios very well once you get further away from the RDA. Uh, even scenario five, the front end nub, uh, and then scenario number eight, TDSs, you can see those oftentimes once you're getting out to 50, 60, 70 nautical miles. You can even make an argument for scenario six and seven. You can see mature mesovortices out beyond 40 nautical miles. You know, and that includes strong mesovortices at times. But again, remember, you're not going to see mesovortex genesis oftentimes beyond 40 nautical miles. So again, we're trying to get away from this whack-a-mole area to we're waiting to see these mesovortices, the whites of its eyes, before issuing severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings. Uh, we've got to get the confidence in issuing these warnings up there with radar operators without the presence of mesovortices or, uh, again, we just got to assume that they're going to be present based on the three ingredients method once you get further away from the radar because you're just not going to see them in the Genesis region. Uh, when it comes to the, the nudgers and distance from radar, yeah, those top three, distance from radar really doesn't matter as much. You know, Gene did mention sometimes you're not going to see uh, some of the core spikes. Sometimes you are. It's dependent a little bit when you get further away from the radar. But oftentimes with some of the other derived products like a VIL, you can get a pretty good idea that you're getting new core development. Uh, maybe you're looking at a cross-section immediately out ahead of the, the mature updraft, downdraft, convergence zone. You know, ML Cape, that's something you know before you're going into an event. You stick that one in your back pocket. You know, if you're the mesoanalyst, you know that nudger is already there before the event even starts. Or, or maybe you've got better thermal that's going to invect in there. That's, that's, again, that's just one you, you've already know. You've got tabs on that one. And then we, we talked about the reflectivity tags, very apparent, even at uh, further distance from the radar, as Lyle pointed out. Once you got into that super res era, you're going you're to see those. Uh, the history of TDSs, that's a little bit more debatable again. But uh, oftentimes you can see those out to 50, 60 nautical miles. Move into the polygon strategies here. Again, this is not the same beast as a supercell. There are generally four different things you've got to consider when drawing up a polygon uh, for a severe thunderstorm or a tornado warning when it comes to mesovortices. Now, you've got some honking forward propagating QLCS in the late spring. You know, obviously, you've got straight line winds to worry about, too. But this is going to be strictly uh, polygons when it's tied to mesovortices. What do you got to consider when you're drawing this thing up? Well, you've got to consider the motion to your line segment first. Also got to be asking yourself, where is my balanced or slightly shear dominant regions tracking? Where are they tracking? Where are any inflection points and bows tracking? And then finally, am I getting any kind of mesovortex migration to the north? If you've got a slightly shear dominant portion of the re, uh, line and inflection points present, odds are pretty high these things are going to tend to migrate north along the updraft, downdraft, convergence zone. You've got to account for that with the northern portion of your polygon. So southern part of your polygon, make sure you capture that balanced region and the track of the bow. 
northern portion of your polygon, make sure you account for any northward migration of the mesovortices. And this, this is going back to the Willard tornado event, a proposed polygon. In this case, it would have been for a tornado warning with all, with all those scenarios and nudges present. That is a proposed polygon for this particular event. Uh, moving into the northern Indiana event, intentionally pick this one a bit further away from the RDA. Again, you're not going to see mesovortices out that far. What you can see, if you kind of blur your eyes there, uh, right before this RF region, you can see a, an inferred circulation there, likely uh, some sort of a bookend vortex because you're, you're shooting the mid-levels of this, this, this bow echo coming in. So you got some bookend action going on there, but you are not going to see the low-level mesovortices. But what you can infer at this point, you've got the three ingredients present because you've got a balanced and a slightly shear dominant region there, so AKA an inflection point. But you've also got an enhanced surge going on, nice rear inflow notch here. You could maybe make an argument for a front inflow notch also there. So you're the Indianapolis office. It's about to move into your CWA. Uh, you've got a couple of scenarios there. Uh, you, you've got a nudger there, um, at, at least with the low-level cape. If you're going to uh, bust out a tornado warning, again, where's my bow tracking? Where's my line segment as a whole tracking? Where are my balanced, slightly shear down regions tracking? And any possible mesovortex migration, where are they going to track, even though we can't see them right now? Considering all those things, well, maybe that's a proposed tornado warning polygon for this particular bow echo. Pretty big area, I know, but further away from the radar. Uh, you you want to be a little bit more liberal with the area, perhaps, if you're further away from the radar. This thing was moving at a pretty good clip, so for this particular one, kind of extended it a few tiers into the CWA. Now, one question you might have asked your, ask yourself, and this may be CWA dependent a little bit. Uh, Springfield CWA, we've got a lot of emergency managers that are and even the media that are still very much in county mode versus storm-based mode. So if you're in a CWA where county lines still matter, you know, draw up your initial polygon. But in this particular case, you've got a CWA that's a little bit more in county mode. You may want to draw a polygon like that. You know, going back to the previous, uh, previous proposal, those two counties there, you've just got small sections that weren't included in that initial polygon. You know, maybe you just extend it to the north a bit and just include those entire counties in case the motion that line segment changes a little bit or, or, or maybe one of these cells takes off. Uh, believe it or not, in this particular case, going with that second proposed polygon, include both those counties, actually paid dividends. I, I believe there was a tornado... I want to say it occurred somewhere right in here uh, in that second county there, if I recall correctly. Just, just something to consider when you're, when you're drawing a polygon up. Uh, if you've got a small portion of a county left out, maybe just include the whole thing. But that's going to be CWA and core partner dependent. Uh, a, a best practice when it comes to drawing up a warning uh, with a line of storms option is to drop your vertices uh, when, when drawing up the line, getting your whole storm line motion together there. Drop your actual worn gen vertices on circulations or TDSs. Uh, this is going to increase the visibility of your warning in that third bullet down there. You don't want to go too crazy here. Otherwise, you're just going to get some huge third bullet with a bunch of locations in it. But if you're dropping a vertex on some of your strongest circulations or a TDS, it increases the visibility of that location that's particularly at risk by mentioning the location in the third bullet, but then also it's going to mention it down below uh, if you're using locations in the warning include, blah, 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 or if you use a path cast, it'll probably show up there too. Again, don't want to go too crazy with the vertices here. Four is probably uh, pushing it. Uh, five would probably be the max amount of vertices you want to use there, but uh, four is probably a good compromise there. Uh, one thing we just tried this spring, and the jury is certainly still out on this one, is uh, the two presentations uh, we've done here today and then the one yesterday, 
We actually shared versions of those with our, our, our TV media, our TV Mets. We actually had emergency county emergency managers also present, a handful of them anyway. Uh, we, we actually shared these with them. Uh, here's what we're looking at when we're considering these severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings. The three ingredients, the whole nine yards. Uh, what we were really after there is, is giving them the better ability to communicate what can often be a confusing message on TV. You know, again, what we've often taught at uh, Storm Spotter safety training is worse is first, and they're, they're often pointing to the front ends of these bow echoes. Here's where your tornado might be, or just north of the apex of this reflectivity. Well, that's not often the case. Again, you get into a slightly sheer dominant portion of a line. We've seen oftentimes just watching these, these TV Mets go wall to wall, they're pointing to the wrong areas. So we really wanted to give them the ability to understand and interpret what we're looking at. So they can get on there when they're going wall to wall and explain why we're issuing larger polygon for, for QLCSs or be able to point to surges and mesovorts within a QLCS so they can point to the greatest threat areas for that particular couple of minutes. And when I say particular couple minutes, we all know that mesovortices can develop and dissipate very quickly. And you may get a new one developing five, six minutes from now. Well, we can go nuts with Warren Gen SVS is all we want, but let's just face it, the actual reach of those isn't that great at times. So TV Mets, while we're getting better at this as an agency, TV Mets are still kind of our ambassadors, especially when they're going wall to wall, at pointing to the greatest threat areas on the air. You know, we've got some vehicles where we can do this better now, especially, you know, say a Twitter, but NWS Chat's probably our best ally there. Conveying these things on NWS Chat is something we've really started harping on. And, and now that we've done this training with our, our TV Mets, we actually are including a little bit more in the va uh, way of advanced information when it comes to the three ingredients or surges here or there. We've got one of our TV Mets, for example, that uses NWS Chat. They, if he's actually got it on a big screen TV, so when he's going wall to wall, he can see us broadcasting this information in the NWS Chat, where he is he, he is actually conveying that stuff on the air as we're sending it over. So NWS Chat has become a huge tool when it comes to these these advanced tidbits on the QLCSs, and really any other convection for that matter. As we start to finally wrap up here, um, you know, we've presented a lot of information these last couple of days. Um, when it comes to memory t retention, I'm, I'm terrible at it. There's just no way you can take it all in. So uh, we have created a Google site here when it comes to examples of three ingredients and all these scenarios for considering the warnings. Uh, if you just go to the, the National Service Springfield Google site here, you'll see a tab for training and research. And embedded within that, you, you, you've got a lot of these guidelines here. Uh, there's also links off of these guidelines to the, the Hollings research that McKenna did a couple of summers back that gets into the specific you know, three ingredients method and how we, we uh, came up with the methodologies. So you've got some cheat sheets here, some, some quick tips, reminders, the best of the best, the three ingredients method of the scenarios, and, and even a, a, a tornado warning worksheet. You want those those eight scenarios and nudges right there at your fingertips when it comes to working the radar desk. Maybe you can slide it underneath the, the glass there. Uh, you've got a worksheet that you can print out or have available to radar operators if they want to fill it out. So, got those materials there for your reference if needed. Finally, I'll just open it up to any questions. Again, I know there's a lot of material there, but... Uh, any questions, comments, or anything you all want to share about your, your findings and what you've seen when it comes to the, the QLCS world? Any questions for Jason? I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think that that might just about do us. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> bored him to death. <laughs> yeah, no, don't worry about it. <laughs> anyway, well, Jason, thank you very much for the last couple of days and a lot of information here, but a lot of great work too by everyone that's for sure a lot of contributors yeah, here certainly a team effort it's not just this office there's been a lot of collaboration going on over the years you know going back to some of the pioneers in the QLCSs you know up through Ron's great work and then some of the more recent work you know we've talked 
Lyle earlier, and there's been a lot of good collaboration. You know, Angie, I don't know if she made the call, and Pat and Paducah. It's just, this is a team effort. Uh, love getting this information out there, the collaboration. We're, we're really moving along when it comes to the QLCS front here. And I know there's been a lot of talk about reducing false alarm. Uh, well, that, that, again, it's the process that matters, but these stats will shake out of this. Start applying some of this latest research. So, right, we're going to get there. We will get there. Yep. Well, excellent. Thanks again, Jason. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we'll have this online, uh, hopefully, uh, by this afternoon. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. All right. Thanks again, John, for setting these up. You're most welcome. And thank All you. Right. Well, well done, sir. Right, thanks. Thanks, Jason. These were really good series of talks. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.